More than two and a half million people come to Cyprus every year on holiday. It's known as the Island of Love because legend has it this is the very spot where the goddess Aphrodite was born. When you're here on holiday, you might enjoy the beaches, the bars and clubs, the archaeological sites and scenery. But you'll hear very little about the island's troubled past. This is an island that's been split in two after years of intercommunal fighting. And the violence and loss is something the people here will never forget. It's more than 40 years since Cyprus became a divided island. The border between the Republic of Cyprus and the north of the island has been in place since 1974. Over the hillsides, right through the capital Nicosia, the buffer zone, as it's known, is a scar on this landscape, an opened wound that hasn't healed. Today, Nicosia is the only divided capital in the world. You've got Turkish Cypriots living just a few streets away, separated by a border called the buffer zone from the Greek Cypriots here in the south. Much is known about the events that separated the two communities in 1974, but the troubles started far earlier in the 1960s, when the relationship between the two sides started falling apart. British colonial rule ended in 1960, and the island grasped its freedom with both hands. A campaign called Ioka, which had sought to unify the island with Greece, was rejected, and Cyprus declared its own independence. Hopes were high, but it wasn't straightforward. The new president, Archbishop Makarios, and the Turkish Cypriot vice president struggled to implement their new constitution. They simply couldn't agree, and it wasn't long before wider social unrest spilled out onto the streets. In December 1963, the tensions escalated out of control. Armed gangs from both communities turned on each other. There were kidnappings and casualties. Britain tried to help restore peace, but the fighting didn't stop. And on the 4th of March 1964, the United Nations felt compelled to take action. A peacekeeping mission was established to patrol the streets, and the first division line, the Green Line, was drawn across the city. Richard Sale, a retired army colonel, was on the island during the 60s. His father worked at the British High Commission at the time and saw the diplomatic struggles firsthand. My father not only met uh, Macarius socially, but dealt with him uh, during the problems. During those three years after independence, tension had been mounting. Both members of the community maintained armed forces. So they were upset people, disappointed people, suspicious people with guns. And it was just really waiting to kick off. Fighting between the two sides escalated again in 1967. And Turkish forces threatened to intervene on more than one occasion. But as the 60s came to a close, things had started to calm down. But behind the scenes, it was a different story. The Eoka B campaign was emerging in Greece, plotting to overthrow the Cypriot government. And on the 15th of July 1974, the National Guard staged a military coup aimed at uniting the country with Greece. The president, Archbishop Makarios, was overthrown but escaped, and Nikos Sampson was put in place. Five days later, in response, Turkish troops arrived, carrying out a full-scale military operation. Now, about three minutes past six, four minutes past six, and the first of the Turkish troops have landed in Cyprus. About five of these aircraft passed over in the last five minutes. They were guided in by jet fighters, and the very first paratroopers are now hitting... Cyprus soil. Over there, Alan.
As of six o'clock Saturday night, we have witnessed over a thousand Turkish troops land on the plains around Gonyeli, less than two miles from Nicosia. Just outside the capital, the arrival of the Turkish paratroopers could be seen from Nicosia Airport, where the UN patrol today. What you can see is you've got the Kyrenia Mountains over there to our right, just the other side of the watchtower. That's all dead ground, that's all flat plain area up there. The sky is basically full of planes and parachutes at 6.30 a.m. Some of the RAF workers here at Nicosia um, were completely overawed and shocked by the scale of the airborne troops that were coming here. They didn't believe that it, it was going to happen and it was going to happen so soon or so close to the airport itself. The human cost of the violence was dear. Loved ones were killed kidnapped or disappeared. Homes were destroyed. The country was torn apart. On the 16th of August, a ceasefire was called and the military lines were recorded, setting out the buffer zone that we know today. Turkish forces now control more than 36% of the island, separated with a border that's 180 kilometers long. People can now travel across checkpoints either side, but the buffer zone is still a no man's land where the UN personnel patrol. Our cameras were invited inside. This is part of Nicosia few people will ever get to see, part of the city centre where time stands still. British soldiers patrol here every day as part of the island's UN peacekeeping mission away from the bustling city streets. It's an area of calm, but in 1974, the fighting here was intense, with opposing forces just metres apart. One stretch is called Spear Alley because of just how close they were. At one stage, this was the most densely occupied frontier in the world, with about 500 troops on either side. So there was two soldiers, one on either side on duty, um, just watching each other and one fell asleep. So the Greek soldier um, made a spear out of a couple of broomsticks on his bayonet, reached across and speared the Turkish soldier. This was the narrowest point in the buffer zone across the whole island, 3.3 uh, metres wide, so incredibly tense. The people that used to live and work here fled, leaving everything behind. The area was ransacked in the fighting. Now the buildings stand crumbling, entwined with barbed wire, scarred by the violence. For the troops serving here, it's a unique place to patrol. Where we patrol, all the, all the OPs are quite close to us and that, so we can see a lot. We notice things a lot more when they change. It's dark and that, it's a bit eerie and that. It's quite a confined space in, in the sea itself. Obviously in this cliff, like we prepare as much as we can. But it isn't until you get out here and you're driving around like um, en route to where you'd be entering the buffer zone that you sort of like have to learn everything quite quickly. It's like you are properly thrown in the deep end. Even after all the destruction and chaos in parts of the city, there are still things that have survived. So this is what we call the museum, which is a collection of things troops have, have found while they've been patrolling. We've got newspapers from 1974. Um, Obviously the sewing machine, books of swatches, old cans of beer and bottles of Coca-Cola, spam, and the old TVs. It's quite a collection of things from the 70s when they all left so quickly and they're all just left behind. So it's stepping back in time to a certain extent. Here they're being preserved and some items are particularly special. In amongst all the ruins and rubble, there were a few unexpected surprises. This was once a car dealership. And in July 1974, they'd just taken delivery of 50 brand new Toyotas. They were put in here for safety as the fighting broke out. And here they still stand. This Corolla only has 33 miles on the clock. There are observation posts on either side of the street. Earlier this year, the Turkish forces added CCTV cameras to some sentry posts a matter which is still being investigated by the UN. The soldiers here have to work closely with both sides, checking for violations, making sure personnel and civilians don't flout the rules. So you get um, things like farming permits, and they're quite quickly resolved. Um, bigger issues might be there's a big event that's going to happen in, in one side or the other, uh, and therefore we need to kind of coordinate 
security for that. It, it is a challenge. It's, it's, it's unique, certainly. It's not Helmand. It's not, you know, other tours, Iraq or whatever, that the British Army has been involved in before. There are, there are things that I've learned and other people have learned from previous tours which you can apply here. Certainly, you know, how to negotiate the liaison aspects. And that is quite similar to here and what we're doing. British soldiers work out of the Ledra Palace Hotel, which is right in the heart of the capital. Argentinian personnel work in the west, and a combined Eastern European contingent work in the east. The UN headquarters are based on the site of Nicosia's old airport. Today the terminal lies derelict, just the scraps and remains left behind. When the fighting broke runways, they came under small arms fire in 1977. Special permission was given for three of them to be patched up and flown back to the UK. But one still remains here today. Wrecked and rusted, it's in the same position where it's been for the past 40 years. Despite the decay and dereliction, it's part of the UN mandate to keep the buffer zone and its buildings exactly as they were when fighting broke out. In 2014, the UN mission marked its 50th anniversary. It was a moment to look back on how things have changed. The biggest initial change, I suppose, was in 74 when it became a peacekeeping mission between two armed forces of the Greek Cypriot National Guard and the Turkish forces in the north. Initially being very much a military-led operation, it has evolved over the years into being much more civilian-led. Uh, the third big difference, I think, is the ratio of um, troops to police and, that, and police and troops to civilians. There's a much smaller military force than there ever was, it's now only 860. There's only just under 70 police left and a larger civilian component um, than there was in the past. However, the mission, the mandate, hasn't changed since 1964. The landscape hasn't altered and the mission's main aim remains the same. But all around the buffer zone, Cyprus is changing. The country wants to move on from the past, but this division is a scar that runs deep. Land stuck in a past that no one can forget. In the centre of Nicosia, the sound of sirens echoes through the streets. On the 15th of July, at 8.20 in the morning, all over the Republic of Cyprus, this is the sound that reminds the country of what happened in 1974. The exact moment of the military coup that prompted Turkey to send in its forces. The start of the fighting that tore this island apart. The Greek Cypriots see the arrival of Turkish forces as an invasion and their presence in the north of the island as an illegal occupation but the Turkish Cypriots see it as a peace operation to protect their community. However you view the events, at times they were both brutal and harrowing, displacing hundreds and thousands of people on both sides. Everyone was affected in some way. Some lost everything. George Sapis and Kallis Tekis look out over the land they left behind. They'll never forget the day they had to leave their homes. In August 1974, one month after Turkish forces had arrived, they were both forced out of their villages. In the distance, George can see his old house in the village of Akna, the other side of the buffer zone. People fled in fear. They were terrified. They couldn't believe what was happening. They thought there would be a settlement and that they would return, so they didn't take very much with them. He now lives half a kilometre away in Acna Forest. The forest he fled to for safety has now become his home. More than 20,000 people arrived here in Acna Forest. Convoy after convoy, Greek Cypriots arrived at the British sovereign base area, leaving their homes and all their belongings behind to escape the oncoming Turkish forces. Initially, they slept here under the trees until humanitarian aid arrived. It became a tented city, a city of refugees with nowhere else to go. Kalis Tekis was forced out of Lissi village. 
They heard the tanks had arrived four kilometers away, and they knew they didn't have long. People heard about the violence happening, killings, rapes. We just built our house a year before, and I told my wife, since I can't take our home with us, we would take what we could. Within two hours, most people have escaped to the forest because the forest had shade, and it was a summer of 39 degrees. We'd watched this sort of thing on TV and saw it happen to others, but didn't think it would be us. You have to realize how big a shock it all was. For years, people stayed living in tents, trying to pick up the pieces of their life, hoping to return. Turkish forces stopped at the boundary to the British bases in the south, but it wasn't clear what would happen next. An evacuation effort was launched by the MOD, helping forces, families and Cypriots to safety. This is a very important announcement from the commander, British forces Near East. Yesterday I mounted an escorted road convoy operation to rescue people from Nicosia. I am delighted and I may say relieved to tell you it was completely successful. At the time, Brian Nicholl was serving with 70 Squadron at RAF Akrotiri. He was moved to Kingsfield Airstrip near Decalia to oversee the evacuations. We were flying 120 people approximately in every Hercules. That meant that there weren't enough seats. And what I did was authorise three people to two seats with a seat belt all the way around there, those three, and children on the floor if necessary or in between the legs. It really was a, a very large humanitarian uh, mission. In fact, the British press said at the time it was the largest one since the Berlin airlift. So it shows you the scale of what was going on at the time. 45,000 Turkish Cypriots were also displaced in a different direction and forced to flee behind their military lines, no longer able to live alongside the neighbours they'd lived next door to for generations. Up in the hills near Polis, the scars of abandonment are still visible. These small villages were once Turkish Cypriot homes. They now lie derelict and empty. No one was spared. The upheaval was felt island-wide. The forced division, impossible to avoid. Lit up on the hillside, the flag of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus today stands emblazoned on the Kyrenia Mountains, proclaiming the slogan, happy to be Turkish. To the international community, this is an occupied territory, unrecognized and frozen by conflict. Outside Kyrenia, this is the beach where the Turkish forces landed on the 20th of July 1974. For Turkish Cypriots like Orhan Tolan, they were greeted as protectors. He'd grown up in a mixed Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot village. In 1963, his father was killed in intercommunal violence. His family fled in fear. I was eight years old. When we, when we moved from village to, the, to Lanaka, when we moved from Lanaka, we, from village to Lanaka, we lost our field because my father was farmer. We lost our field. After uh, 63, when trouble start, again we moved another house. And in 74, we moved again from south to north. That is why we were always like refugees in our country. The TRNC covers more than 36% of the island. A quarter of a million people live here, and Turkey's estimated 40,000 troops remain. While the Republic of Cyprus has joined the EU, the North faces economic isolation. Sanctions mean nearly all imports and exports have to travel through Turkey. The average income is around half that of the South. It, it is difficult. It is very difficult to organize the economy because uh, you are somewhere that no one recognizes you, only R Turkey is recognized us, and we are um, under, con under of embargoes of the world. That is why we have to find our way to live in this situation. In 2003, the crossing between the north and the south opened to the public for the first time since 1974. 
Up until then, the only other way across was via a UN checkpoint, and visitors were often treated with suspicion. Yanis Papadakis is an author and professor at the University of Cyprus. In the 90s, he spent a year living on both sides of the divided capital, trying to understand what happened. I think mistrust is one of the things that really joins the two sides together. In the end of the day, I think mistrust is created if people don't acknowledge the violence they inflicted on others. I think once this is acknowledged, it's possible to maybe close these wounds and move ahead in the future. But the more these are not acknowledged, the more this fear and mistrust um, emerges. Years have passed now. The history books have been written in many different ways, each side with its own scars and stories. The two leaders, President Nikos Anastasiades and Avis Sarolu, have been meeting regularly since the 11th of February 2014, trying to pursue a solution. But hopes for the future are mixed. We are trying to make a peace. We want a peace, and uh, if we'll be peace, I believe that we'll be good for us, we'll be, we'll be good for the Greek side, for the island, for everywhere. The peace must be in our heart, must be in our uh, brain. As I told you, my father was killed by Eoka in 63, and I forget it, because I want to build something for my children, for my grandchildren. For our future. Personally, I believe the situation is irreversible. That's why, for the first time in my life, I've started again with a new career. We need to mend our relationship with the Turkish Cypriots to unite Cyprus. That's why I go there regularly to see the region. I can't accept the idea that the north belongs to Turkey. I cannot conceive of not going there again. We have to go there for our kids and grandkids. Our generation made a mess of things, but we have to see it for the future generation. But that future remains uncertain, and for some, the pain of the past haunts them every day. 2,001 people went missing when the fighting broke out. 1,508 Greek Cypriots and 493 Turkish Cypriots. The Committee on Missing Persons has been set up to find out what happened, bringing in geneticists, anthropologists and archaeologists from both sides of the island. Arguably, the problem with missing persons is one of the key things that divides both communities on this island. It's a real obstacle to reconciliation because so many families are affected. Um, and by resolving the problem with the missing persons, um, for sure uh, we're helping to remove an important, not all, but one important obstacle to reconciliation. The team start collecting information on where people are buried. Many tip-offs are anonymous. Then the archaeological teams go out into the field. 100 excavations are carried out a year. 40 years on, often the sites are hard to find. Everything is brought here for analysis. It's a very difficult process, but it's also a necessary process because unlike most other trauma that you can find, the, the trauma of relatives of a missing person is something that it doesn't heal. It's, it's literally, it's an open wound. People cannot uh, compensate this trauma. They live with it and it stays with them until the moment where they gain certainty about what happened. Each of these boxes contains the remains of someone still waiting to be identified. Already 521 people have been named and their remains return to their families for burial. There are still a thousand people missing out there somewhere waiting to be found. In the Republic of Cyprus, the 20th of July is a day of mourning. Memorial services are held all across the island, paying tribute to the soldiers who died in the fighting. In the north, it's a very different story, celebrating peace. But the memories of what happened are very much alive. However they're remembered, they haunt people still. And the anger and uncertainty for the future hasn't gone away. Going back to the way things were seems unlikely, and the way forward is unclear. 
but north or south, the people of Cyprus know this island has endured many things. And with every year that passes, through despair, there is still hope.